out uh, for you guys. Uh, so if you would, yeah, just follow along on the screen or the passages are Galatians 5, 22 to 24, as well as Mark 10, 17 to 31. So let's read these two passages together. Okay. Galatians 5, 22 to 24. But the fruit of the spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such things, there is no law. And those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. Mark 10, 17 to 31. Uh, it's the story of the rich young man. It goes like this. And as he was setting out on his journey, a man ran up and knelt before him, that is Jesus, and asked him, good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus said to him, why do you call me good? No one is good except God alone. You know the commandments. Do not murder. Do not commit adultery. Do not steal. Do not bear false witness. Do not defraud. Honor your father and mother. Mother. And he said to him, teacher, all these I have kept from my youth. And Jesus, looking at him, loved him and said to him, you lack one thing. Go, sell all that you have and give to the poor. And you will have treasure in heaven and come follow me. Disheartened by the saying, he went away sorrowful, for he had great possessions. And Jesus looked around and said to his disciples, how difficult it will be for those who have wealth to enter the kingdom of God. And the disciples were amazed at his words. But Jesus said to them again, children, how difficult it is to enter the kingdom of God. It is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich person to enter the kingdom of God. And they were exceedingly astonished and said to him, then who can be saved? Jesus looked at them and said, with man, it is impossible, but not with God, for all things are possible with God. Peter began to say to him, see, we have left everything and followed you. Jesus said, truly, I say to you, there is no one who has left house or brothers or sisters or mother or father or children or lands for my sake and for the gospel who will not receive a hundredfold now in this time houses and brothers and sisters and mothers and children and lands with persecutions and in the age to come eternal life the many who are first will be last and the last first this is the word of god uh so once again good morning everyone for those of you who don't know me my name is winston and today i would like to uh i have the privilege of giving the last message in our fruit of the spirit series uh, but before we begin, would you uh, join me and bow your heads with me in prayer as we just give today's time um, and this message to the Lord. Holy Father, we praise you and thank you that you are a God um, who has revealed yourself to be a God who is love. You are a God who loves us before the foundation of the world. Um, you have planned all the days of our lives um, from the beginning, and in each of them, you have promised that you uh, will work all things for the good of those um, who love you and call according to your purpose. Uh, God, we thank you that in your word we have um, not only such an amazing revelation of who you are, but these amazing promises, promises um, that you will keep us, that you will guide us. Um, that you will be a God of all comfort towards us, that you will uh, surely bless us and, and sing over us with great delight. God, you are a God who um, is um, overflowing in your grace uh, um, towards us. And because of that, we know um, that you are a God we can trust. You are a God we can um, put before all things um, and submit them into your hands. God, we just pray as we think about this last fruit of the Spirit, um, that it is your spirit who is working um, today. Um, as we gather together, that it is your spirit who uh, illuminates your word in our hearts, um, who gives us ears to hear and hearts um, to understand, eyes to see. Um, and that God, as we think about self-control, it would not be 
um, self-focused. Um, but that as we think about self-control, um, we would know um, what it is to have true self-control, uh, a way that, um, yeah, is, um, that glorifies you because, um, yeah, true self-control comes from you, God, comes from uh, your fruit by your spirit within us. So God, we, um, yeah, um, are open to receive from you this morning. And, and we just pray that you would, uh, yeah, uh, give even as we are asking and, and, and show yourself even as we are seeking you. Praise in your son's name. Amen. Okay, so uh, today's message I've entitled uh, Self-Control is Self-Denial. Uh, it's a sort of interesting sort of title, something that um, really came to me as I was thinking about uh, these two passages, both in Galatians and in uh, the Gospel of Mark. Um, and so I'm really excited to be able to get straight into it. Um, so let's just begin with some recap. So why are we doing the fruit of the spirit uh, fruit of the spirit series? Uh, the reason why we're doing the fruit of the spirit as a series is because our last series uh, was on the letter of Galatians, and uh, it was entitled "No Other Gospel." What we learned in the letter of Galatians is, is that Paul here is giving us an explanation of the gospel because he's trying to correct a group of mistaken Jewish Christians who believe that the extra requirements of the Old Testament law are needed in order to be saved. For Paul, uh, this idea of needing to fulfill the law is understandable, but also extremely dangerous. It's extremely dangerous because it denies the sufficiency of Christ as the source and also the sole element of our salvation. As Paul says here in Galatians 2, 15 to 16, that we know that a person is not justified by works of the law, but through faith in Jesus Christ. And we also have believed in Christ Jesus in order to be justified uh, by faith in Christ and not by works of the law, because by works of the law, no one will be justified. Nevertheless, uh, Paul in Galatians 5 explains that while works are not the condition by which we receive salvation, they are certainly the result of our salvation. Uh, and the reason why is because once we believe in Christ and his atoning sacrifice, we are reconciled with God in new relationship with him and united to him through the Holy Spirit. And this Holy Spirit, he who dwells within us, the more we abide in him, the more we receive from him, the more we grow in him, the more our being changes such that what comes out of our union with God is a flourishing of all types of virtues. Uh, here represented in Galatians 5, 22 to 23 as good fruit. Um, it's important to note that, uh, as we've said um, in all of these uh, messages, that it doesn't say fruits of the spirit, um, uh, seeming as if like, you know, uh, these different character traits are might be separate. Rather, the fruit of the spirit here, singular, suggests that all of these things are like part of one big fruit, are part of one uh, character trait, one type of person. And that as the Holy Spirit works in us, it's not that some of us become loving, but not joyful. Some of us become peaceful, but not gentle. But rather in the Holy Spirit, all of this grows within us. Today, uh, as you can see on the screen, we are looking at the last of these fruits, uh, namely self-control. And uh, I think self-control is maybe an interesting one, something that we heard of that maybe haven't talked about or thought about much. Um, and it's an interesting addition to these particular character traits, yeah? Typically, when we think about the character traits of a good person, a righteous person, a godly person, what do we think of? We think of emotions, right? We think of things like being loving, being patient, being kind, being faithful, being gentle. 
And here, uh, by contrast, self-control in comparison to all the other fruits that are on screen seems more to be like a skill than a fruit. You know, you want to say that like uh, uh, an athlete or a, a, a pianist has great self-control, control of their own physical body. Why is it that here the fruit of the spirit leads to self-control? It's in this introduction, I would like to say that self-control, I believe, personally, is one of the most important fruit here. So important, actually, that it deserves to be the last fruit in this list. Why is that the case? Well, the reason why I think that self-control is so important is because if you look at all the other virtues, look at all the other character traits, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, etc. what you'll see is, is that most of us have these character traits some of the time. We love some of the time. We're joyful some of the time. We're patient some of the time. And actually it is self-control that completes all of these other virtues. If we didn't have self-control, it is self-control that allows us to be loving, not only in the easy times, but the hard times. To have the self-control, not only to be patient when it's easy, but to be patient when it's not easy. So just to get you to, to think about this, obviously, when a family is so joyful and having such a great time, you say, oh, I'm having such a great time. Someone tells you, you should love your family. Very easy. Yeah. But in the midst of family arguments, how much harder is it to control yourself, to let go of anger, to put someone above or ahead of you and to love them? Let's say you get some good news, right? Um, and because of that, you, you feel joy, right? And someone says, oh, you know, you got this, rejoice. Be happy that you got that. Really easy to follow. Something that we can all do with our eyes closed, with our hands tied behind our backs. But what happens if there is bad news, worse news that appears? If someone says to you, be joyful, how could you possibly be joyful? What would it take for you to be joyful in this situation? How are you going to do this? And my answer to you is self-control. And so before we even go into what God's word says about self-control, this is my reflection question to you. And so I'm going to give you roughly 30 seconds. Um, maybe you can uh, think about it as, uh, as, we, uh, as, I, as I'm talking. Um, where do you lack? self-control? Where is it in your life that you find it hard to control yourself? Don't think about the moments where it's easy to. Um, it's so easy for all of us just to pat ourselves on the back uh, and say, oh yeah, I control myself uh, when I'm with my friends. I control myself when I'm with here and there, right? Where do you lack self-control? Where is it that it's harder to love? Where is it that you can't control your joy, you find it so hard to be joyful? Where is it that you find it so hard to be peaceful? Where do you lack the control to center yourself? Where do you lack the, the control to be patient with um, people? Which people? Who is it that makes you lack self-control? Who is it that makes you uh, unable to be kind, to be good, to be faithful, to be gentle. Where is it that you lack self-control? Do we give you like 15 more seconds just to think about this for yourself? And hopefully as we uh, learn uh, from God's word together, um, we will be able to, yeah, be grow, uh, be continue to grow in the Holy Spirit. Good. So what is the sort of trajectory of today's message? So today's message is uh, divided into three parts. Firstly, we're going to consider what is self-control according to God's word. Second, uh, what is the problem that we have with self-control? And finally, what is the way to self-control? 
So without further ado, let's get straight into it. Okay. What is self-control? Okay. So rather than talking about what is self-control, like for us, the definition, um, I'm more interested in what the Bible means by self-control here. What part of the self are we talking about here when we're talking about self-control? Do we have to control our actions? Do we have to control our thoughts, our emotions, our desires, our body, our minds? It's clear that the idea of self-control obviously involves all sorts of things. But in the Bible, self-control is primarily described in, in this sort of image. And it's an image of controlling our bodies. So here are just two passages, um, one from 1 Corinthians 9 and one from 1 Thessalonians. 1 Corinthians 9 here, uh, Paul uh, explains the Christian life, right? Christian growth. Um, through this analogy of an athlete. And what he says that is, is that when athletes go for a race in order to receive a prize, they do so through extreme training, extreme discipline. And this discipline involves uh, self-control. It involves being able to, verse 27, discipline your body and keep it under control so that you won't be disqualified. 1 Thessalonians 4 verse 3 to 7 says uh, roughly the same thing, that uh, what does it mean, verse 3, to, to, uh, to, uh, to follow God's will and to be sanctified? It is to abstain from sexual immorality and then to control each of our own body in holiness and honor. So what the Bible means by self-control is a control of our body. But note that when the Bible says controlling our body, it doesn't necessarily mean controlling our physical body. Rather, when the Bible talks about controlling our body, in fact, uh, there is this idea of the body as having so many passions and desires that aim to take over our control. In Matthew 26, 41, Jesus says in the Garden of Gethsemane, Pray that you don't enter into temptation because the spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. That's to say that there are two forces at war with each other within yourself. There is you, and then there is your body, your flesh, which um, has certain control over you such that you constantly have to wrestle against it. 1 Corinthians 7, when talking about singleness and marriage, Paul gives this advice to remain single, but, verse 9, if they cannot exercise self-control, they should marry. Why? For it is better to marry than to burn with passion. What is Paul imagining here? Paul is imagining that uh, a person who cannot control themselves and therefore needs to marry is a person that has a body burning with passion. It's not as if there's just a body there that you can control. You can control your arms fine, you can control your head fine, you can move that, and there's no problem there. It's as if your body is, is fighting against you, burning with passion, such that where you want to go, it's not where it wants to go. And so finally, to put all of this stuff together, what is self-control? Self-control is this ability it's a mastery of controlling your body, of guiding your emotions rather than letting yourself be guided by emotions. Uh, this is exactly how uh, God speaks about it in Genesis 4, um, in the, the first murder. Um, here God says to Cain, uh, before uh, when his uh, sacrifice and offering is not accepted, that uh, if he does not do well, sin is crouching at his door. Its desire is contrary to you, but you must rule over it. That is to say that here, there is a part of you, a sinful part of you, that has all of these desires against you, but you must have self-control. You must rule over it. In the same way as uh, man was supposed to rule over God's creation, 
um, to bring it into fruition in Genesis 1 to 2. So too must we do that in our own body and rule over it that we may have self-control. James 3, when talking about speech, talks about this uh, as uh, with various analogies, right? It talks about uh, how there are bits that you place in the horses of mouths in order to obey and to guide. And, and with ships, we have rudders, so that even the small rudder, by moving just so slightly, can direct the entire ship. So too, do we need to control our tongue, our heart, our eyes, um, our hands in such a way that it is us that is guiding it rather than us being led by it? As such, the Bible's picture of a self-control is kind of like a charioteer, someone who is horse riding who uses strength and wisdom to guide your emotions and desires rather than to let your emotions and uh, desires take over. Finally, in this section on a self-control, and this is gonna be like the first mini application point, self-control here, uh, according to God's word, is something that is essential to Christian growth. Please don't be mistaken. Self-control here is not one part of the Bible that's like an optional skill. It's not an elective that you can take, right? Uh, Self-control here is the anchor which grounds you in your actions. Uh, Self-control here is not just something that uh, is like an additional thing that might be nice. It is something that is essential to all of the virtues and it's something that is important for all of us to cultivate, all of us to uh, continue to um, come before God in order to, to learn and to grow in. Uh, 1 Thessalonians 4 verse 3 to 7, the uh, passage that we uh, read out just then, um, when we're talking about how to control our bodies, uh, Paul begins by saying, this is the will of God, your sanctification. That is to say, uh, what is self-control? Self-control is the will of God. It is how you become sanctified. Titus 2, verses 11 to 12, um, and all of Titus 2 is, uh, in essence, about self-control in this way, um, says that the grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation, you know, that this good news has come. What does this good news come to do? To, verse 12, train us to renounce ungodliness and worldly passions and to live self-controlled, upright and godly lives in the present age. Jesus, when he's talking in the Sermon on the Mount, right? Uh, most of the Sermon on the Mount has this sort of like uh, perfection element towards it, right? So people say, you have heard you shall not murder, but don't even curse your brother. You have heard you shall not commit adultery, but don't even look at somebody in the wrong way. You have heard, you know, to uh, an eye for an eye for two for two, but love your enemies, turn the other cheek. And in the conclusion of all of these commands in chapter five, Jesus says at the end of Matthew five, you therefore must be perfect as your heavenly father is perfect. Perfect in the sense, not just as in like, you, know, you can't go wrong. You're, you're so handsome. You're so smart. Like, no, no, not in that sense. Perfect as in perfectly controlled. Perfect to do what is right in the standards of God, such that you don't miss a single thing. This is what God calls us to do. This brings us to the second uh, section, which is on the problem of self-control. And here, the problem of self-control, uh, why, why is it that we have a problem with self-control? Now that we know what it is, why is it that we, most of us, or arguably all of us, struggle with this idea of self-control? Um, and my answer to you is that the problem with self-control is that it is extremely difficult. It is extremely difficult because of our sin. In sin, our will is corrupted. Our desires have gone haywire and it's impossible to be a good horse rider. 
if both you as a person is so weak and corrupted, if your horses, that is your bodily passions and desires are so strong and out of control, how is it possible for you to have self-control? Paul explains this and describes it in vivid image in Romans 7, when he talks about his experience with sin. Uh, I'm going to start from, from the beginning. Uh, we know that the law is spiritual, but I am of the flesh, sold under sin. For I do not understand my own actions. For I do not do what I want, but I do the very thing I hate. Now, if I do what I don't want, I agree with the Lord that it is good. So now it is no longer I who do it, but sin that dwells within me. For I know that nothing good dwells in me that is in my flesh. For I have the desire to do what is right, but not the ability to carry it out. For I do not do the good I want. But the evil I do not want is what I keep on doing. For I do what I do not want, and it is no longer I who, who does it, but sin that dwells within me. I'm paraphrasing here, of course, just to make it a bit easier to understand. Um, but yes, I, Paul concludes, so I find it to be a law that when I want to do right, evil lies close at hand, for I delight in the law of God in my inner being, but I see in my members another law waging war against the law of my mind and making me captive to the law of sin that dwells in my members. Paul's explanation of um, our state without Christ, without the spirit, as fighting a losing battle, as having this war, but ultimately being held captive. Why is that the case? How can we get out of this situation of self-control? And it's here that I would like to bring our attention to the second passage of today, which is on the rich young man. Most of us uh, think of the rich young man as a story about commandments, a story about wealth. Um, but today I would like to explain why I believe that it is in this passage that Jesus gives us some of the best sort of advice and uh, picture of what self-control is. The rich young man is in fact a story of self-control. Okay, so how does the story go? The story begins with uh, Jesus setting out on a journey and a man coming before him and asking him a, a classic sort of uh, Jewish rabbinical question. And he asked uh, Jesus, good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Here, eternal life is not just talking about that I will live forever, but eternal life is also the life that is from God. Uh, recall uh, Psalm 1, where uh, it says that the person who is blessed by God, who is uh, a one who seeks God's word, is a tree whose leaves never wither and whose fruits spring in every, uh, every season. Um, that is to say that here, what uh, this man is looking for is the right way, the, the true way of life, the way of life that is better and eternal. And, and it's clear that Jesus instantly understands what this person is asking for. Because Jesus responds to him by saying that no one is good except God alone. This way to inherit eternal life, this way to find this, uh, the true way of being human comes from nowhere but God alone. And so he continues to the commandments, which are the word of God. Do not murder. Do not commit adultery. Do not steal. Do not bear false witness. Do not defraud. Honor your father and mother. And here, surprisingly, the rich young man responds by saying that he has kept these commandments. This rich young man is not just a, a, a foolish young person uh, who is just asking a, a, a casual question to Jesus. No, this is a person who is seriously tried to find the right way and seriously through his own diligence being keeping the commandments as to find God's way. 
And Jesus, looking at this, gives this surprising response. After saying that he has kept these commandments, Jesus says, you lack one more thing. Go and sell all that you have and give to the poor and you will have treasure in heaven and come and follow me. And it is this thing that this rich young man lacks, according to Jesus, that he cannot understand. And so the rich young man leaves and goes away. This is a very interesting passage because it seems as if, um, yeah, like as if this rich young man should have been able to come joyful should have been able to listen and gain something. But instead, he leaves with nothing. He leaves having been uh, discouraged and sorrowful. And so the question that I would like us to think about is, why? Why did the rich young man fail? If we read... Uh, Mark 10, verse 23 to 26, here on the screen, in the wrong way. It is easy to say that, oh, well, the reason why the rich young man failed is because he was rich. It's because of his wealth, right? And if you read it in that way, uh, this seems to be how the disciples um, understood Jesus' answer. And, and that's why they were so astonished and confused here. So notice here that Jesus explains that it is difficult for those who have wealth to enter the kingdom of God. The disciples were amazed at this. And Jesus says again that it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich person to enter the kingdom of God. And so the disciples listen to this and, and astonish and say, who then can be saved? What I would like to suggest to you is, is that in this passage, how we understand this is not just to say that wealth is bad and that uh, poverty is good. Right? Rather, what Jesus is saying is something a bit deeper. Notice that this idea of a camel going through uh, the tiny hole at the top of a needle seems crazy, seems absurd, right? Um, and if you're saying this as just take this literally, then, of course, no rich person is going to enter the kingdom of God because there's no way for a camel to go through the eye of a needle. But metaphorically, what we see is, is that here, uh, Jesus is still thinking about this idea of wealth. is still thinking about possessions. Uh, a camel in, in this uh, society would be the symbol, the representative of possession of things that you carry on a journey. In fact, Jesus is setting out on a journey in this very passage. And, and, and a camel that is filled with all of your possessions, so rich with things, could not go through a needle. Notice that in a needle, is if you have just too thick of a, of a string, too thick of a thread, you won't be able to get it through, right? How much more if you have a camel that is filled with stuff? This is the analogy that Jesus is saying. The problem, the reason why the rich young man failed is not that he didn't have enough self-control. It is that he had too many desires. He had too many possessions. Rather than saying this, the problem with our self-control, we controlling our emotions, controlling our desires, and we say, oh, maybe I'll just have better strength. Maybe with my willpower, right? I'll just control more. I'll just train myself harder. I'll just discipline more. And yet you're carrying this weight, this weight of desires, of worldly passions, which choke you and which burden you. This is the analogy that Jesus is saying here. This is why it is difficult for those who have wealth to enter the kingdom of God. What is the application? The application point is to say that the problem of self-control is not a problem of willpower. It is a problem of the heart. If you look into the world, right, what you'll see from many, many sort of self-help books, yeah, the problem is always to do with your, your, your will. You just try harder, just be more patient, just cheer up, 
yeah? And, and the assumption in our society is, is that if we just used our own will, we would be able to get out of our situation. We would be able to get out of certain mindsets and we would be able to therefore control ourselves, our emotions, our actions, maybe even our future, right? But what the Bible says is that well beyond the problem of willpower, there is a deeper problem in you and me and each and every one of us. And that's the problem of the heart. The problem of the heart is this problem of your desires, your desires, which constantly uh, come up and create a foe that is harder for you to battle than, than you can ever battle yourself. Uh, Matthew 6, verse 19 to 21 and 24, Jesus talks about the same thing about wealth. And, and what he says is not about willpower. He says, lay up treasure, uh, don't lay up treasures on earth, but lay up treasures in heaven because, verse 21, where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Verse 24, no one can serve two masters for either he will hate the one or love the other. He'll be devoted to one or despise the other. You cannot serve God and money. This is what I, I want you to think about this application point. And, 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 and the point is this, right? At the end of the day, who is it that really is stopping you from having self-control? Who do you think is it that stops you from having self-control. And my answer to you and to myself is it's you. You are the one who stops yourself from having self-control. When you look at these emotions, right? Uh, like let's say, for example, uh, loving someone when you feel anger, right? Who is it that stops you from having the self-control to love or to have the self-control to be patient? It's you. It's your emotion. It's your emotion of anger, of fear, of pride, of greed, of laziness, of slothfulness. It is your doubts, your anxieties, your insecurities, your uh, arrogance that stops you from having self-control. It's not your will. It's your desire. It's your heart. This is what uh, Jesus is telling the rich young man, above just keeping commandments using your actions and your will. The commandments point to your heart. The commandments point to your desires, to you, to all these things that you want for yourself and you hold on to. Which brings me to the final section. What is the way to self-control? So here, what Jesus says to the rich young man, the way to inherit eternal life, the way to finally keep the commandments as they're asked, as they're called to be, uh, uh, called to be kept um, is this verse 21 to go to sell all that you have to give away everything to the poor so that you have treasure in heaven and then to come and to follow him when the disciples ask and they say who can be saved if, if, if rich people can't enter the kingdom of God Jesus says that with man it is impossible, but not with God. For all things are possible with God. What Jesus is talking about here is not that it is possible with God to stuff a camel into the eye of a needle. No, that's not the point. The point is to say the way to self-control is self-denial. It is to say that with your own strength, you will never defeat these desires. You will never control yourself. You will never inherit eternal life. So get rid of it. Get rid of all of your desires. Get rid of all of that which is in you that keeps you in bondage and slavery, that keeps you captive. 
Don't trust in your willpower. Don't trust in your training. Don't trust in your discipline. Don't trust in your godliness. Trust in God. With man, it is impossible. With God, all things are possible. This is why this title is, uh, this sermon is titled Self-Control is Self-Denial. As Jesus says um, in earlier passage in Mark 8, what does it mean to come and follow Jesus? To go and sell everything and to come and follow him. It is to deny yourself, to take up this cross and to follow him. Why? Because in Mark 8, 35, whoever would save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for the gospel will save it. We see this also at the end of Galatians 5. That the fruit of the spirit is all here, right? And, and it comes uh, from, from the spirit itself, not from our own works, um, but from um, our union with God. And in verse 24, how is it that we find this self-control? Verse 24, those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. To deny it all, to let it all go. And the Bible doesn't just give you a way, it gives you a promise. And the promise is, if you let go, if you deny yourself, if you trust him enough to give your, your life to him, you're not doing a losing deal. You're doing the best deal that anybody could ever offer you. You let go in order to gain more. It is as if you had a, 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 a grocery shopping bag filled with two items. And the reason why you let go is so that you can catch a million dollars, right? It's not letting go just so that you lose everything. It's letting go because you need to open your hands to just keep on receiving more and more and more from God. This is how this story of the rich young man finishes. Peter, in contrast to the rich young man, says that he has left everything to follow Jesus. And Jesus says, truly, I say to you, there is no one who has left house or brothers or sisters or mother or father or children or lands for my sake and for the gospel, who will not receive a hundredfold now in this time. Houses and brothers and sisters and mothers and children and lands with persecutions, to be sure, right? God doesn't promise a, a, uh, completely stress-free life but he promises blessings that are way more than you can ever imagine and finally and in the age to come eternal life the many who are first will be last and the last first this is to say that god's road god's ways god's wisdom is, is very contrary to our ideas. It's an upside down kingdom. It's an upside down kingdom that in some ways, those who we think should be last end up first. Those who we think should be first end up last. The more you gather for yourself, the more you're actually losing out on this opportunity. The more you seem like a fool, an absolute fool in this world, absolute last place, dead play, a dead last, useless, the more um, you are receiving the best that this universe could ever offer. To be called child of the living God, to be called co-heirs with Christ. What more could you, what more could, could a CEO offer you? What could Tim Cook Elon Musk, what could they offer you that God couldn't offer you uh, in a way that's just, there's no comparison. And if that's true, just in like, if that's true, just in, in material things, it is also true spiritually. That spiritually, the more you let go of your life and give it to God, 
the more you will gain, the more these fruit will grow. The more inside you, you'll be transformed, you'll be changed in such a way that you wouldn't, you wouldn't uh, like sort of uh, recognize yourself five years later because God has so changed you. You've given so much to God for him to change that he's only improved you and chiseled you down to be just so much more than you are right now. What's the application point? The application point is to say that true self-control comes from submitting your desires and your ways to God. Is to say, and to look at God and to say, look, God, I, I have all of these things that I'm trying and I, I can't do it. And, 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 and maybe right now you're scared of giving things to God. It's so much easier to control your life the way you want it, the way you expect it, the way that you can handle. It's so much harder to give it to God and to say, you know, I have no idea what you'll do to me, God. I have no idea where you'll take me. I have no safety net if I give myself to you. But know that this person that you're giving to, this person that you are giving your life to can be trusted. When Jesus looks at the rich young man and, and looks at, at his heart to keep commandments, he doesn't see an ignorant rich person. He doesn't see a person that, that, uh, that is just looking for things. Jesus sees this person and looking at him, loved him. What Jesus is saying here, more than just, oh, just deny yourself, oh, just keep the commandment is that Jesus wants this person for all his entirety, for his heart. It's not just to sell everything because that's such a Christian thing to do. It's to sell everything and to follow, to come to him. And in your weakness, in your failings, when you come to God and you say, I don't have self-control. I barely have a self, let alone self-control. Jesus looks at you and he will love you. He won't look at you in your shame, in your guilt, in your pride and say, nah, I can't accept that. He will look at you and he will love you. He will look at you and he'll say, come, follow, come, follow. And that is his promise to you. Romans 8 verse 32 says, he who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all. How he not also with him graciously gave us all things. If, 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 if the very God who created this entire world gave up his control to the point of dying on a cross in order to obtain us, how much easier is it for us to give up our lives for him? So this is my application point to you. When we think about self-control, a lot of the times we go into a dead end. We try to use um, this thing, willpower, in order to save ourselves. And we find it lacking and incomplete. But what the Bible tells us is just that if we deny ourselves, if we ask from him, if we, if, we, if we are controlled by his ways, controlled by his plans, his desires, his kingdom, we'll see that all of a sudden, things are so much easier to control. All of a sudden, um, yeah, as it says in this hymn, to turn your eyes upon Jesus and look full in his wonderful face. And the things of earth will grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace. Shall we pray together? Oh God, as we turn our eyes and fix our eyes upon Christ, the author and perfecter of our faith, the one who for the joy set before us endured scorn and shame, um, and is seated now on the right hand of God. God, as we look to him, um, of your great love, of how far you are willing to go um, in order to love us, how far you are willing to go 
in order to serve us, how far you are willing to go, um, that you might meet us and that we might um, follow you. God, I pray that you would give us faith. God, I pray that as we, yeah, ask you, um, ask you to change us, ask you to help us, ask you uh, to lead us into only your ways and your desires more and more. Um, and in that, to find eternal life, to find something, an inheritance that is greater than anything that this world can offer. God, I pray that as we, yeah, look to you, that you would be pleased to accept us, that you would come and love us and show yourself in such a way um, that we would praise you and adore you, that we would be so captivated uh, by uh, your glory, your grace, your love, uh, that we would uh, look and feel full in your wonderful face. Um, and that in that we would find, um, yeah, true life. We thank you um, for revealing yourself for who you are. Um, we pray this in your son's name. Amen. Um,